little bit more of a general overview because uh, we we had prior to the P67 sum, uh, launch, we actually had a technical summit where we invited a lot of key media to come out, get a straight hands-on overview and preview of everything that we were doing. Since you guys didn't get to do that, I'm going to give you a little bit more of a uh, actually advanced recap on some okay. of the implementations that we're bringing forth on the P67 lineup. Since you'll be taking a look at that, as well as some of the newer stuff that we haven't shown off yet. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Yep. Um, so uh, we'll use kind of, actually we'll jump to mainstream instead of we'll go okay. keep our yeah, for that's 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 the end. So uh, we'll kind of just use this as our initial building block here. Let me. So um, the big thing about you know our, our P67 lineup, we internally on the ACI side. So what I mean by ACI, that's the ASUS American mm -hmm. side. We started probably about eight months beforehand where we had internal about weekly conference calls and discussions with headquarters on what we were going to look to do with the board design. Um, we really felt that, you know, the previous chipsets, we had fantastic boards, we had great implementations, but we really wanted to kind of collectively take all the feedback that we were getting from media and the general community, whether they were overclockers, gamers, enthusiasts, and go back and pretty much redo everything on the board. And you'll see that when you take a look at the entire board stack. Like going down to the entry level, which is the P67, the standard board, it's a $160 board. Going all the way up, there's a whole lot of design consistency. And the reason why we want to do that is that we want people to know that as soon as they bought into the board, regardless of the segment class, they were going to guarantee across every single board. So basics are going to be like, you know, simple things were fundamentals. I don't come from a marketing background. I come from consultation, assembly, technical repair. So when I look at a board, I don't ever look at the features first. I just look at the core things when I'm putting together a board, I want it to make sense, right? Okay. So, you know, every single board, all the serial ATA are all right angle. Every single board is dual slot spacing for okay. the primary by 16 PCIe. That way we maintain good airflow when users are putting in dual slot cards. Mm -hmm. Which as we know, now even cheap cards are dual slot. You go down even like a 5750 and it's dual slot, mm -hmm. right? Um, all the mainstream boards all have buy one accessible at the top. We got a lot of demand feedback that users adding in something like a NIC or they're adding sound card, they want it right there at the top, right? Um, then from there, additionally, BT is present on the entire board stack. Okay. So even from the standard board, that's present there. We'll go into some of the software and what makes that specific, but even from the baseline, the big focus is on IO connectivity, so that's 2.1 EDR. Mm -hmm. Then the big thing that we're really proud of is the DGBRM, right? So we went to a digital PWM as well as specifics in terms of its implementation across the board. So we launched the DGBRM on ROG, but we're really happy that we brought it all the way pretty much down to the most accessible price point. And the main reason why is from a, a core fundamental design, as you guys have probably gotten information from Intel, you know that it's all about transient response with Turbo. Right. Because the Turbo switch is occurring so dynamically, right? We essentially wanted to be able to ramp to Turbo as fast as possible, sustain it, and be able to drive it as efficiently as possible. So that was the main reason why we went with digital. There were other additional facets as why we did it, whether it was with the software or other specific premises that we'll touch on, but we're really happy that across the board it's present. Now some of the things that are specific to the GG Plus BRM, in P55 we introduced something that was called T-Pro, mm -hmm. and we kind of advanced upon that. So for your BRM, the choke, the driver, and the MOSFET, right? We can actually monitor per phase band, right? So per the choke, the driver, and the MOSFET, either temperature or current. Now the reason why we do that is before we've always done what's called phase switching, right? So depending under load, it ramps down to let's say like four phase and under max load it'll go up to like 16, right? Mm -hmm. But now, not just on load, which we have a lot more granularity, we have huge efficiency. We can go 1, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 16. So we have a huge amount of switching frequency range, but we can now also balance based off of temperature. So what that means is that as we're driving the BRM and under load, we can actually rebalance the phase usage based on per bank phase temperature. So that's pretty cool. But the problem with that though is, uh, as you, I don't know how, how good your part was. How, did you end up getting uh, ramp gears up a little bit? I know we were talking about them before. Well, I ended up, what I ended up getting it to, because they cut me back, <laughs> I had it to 5.2, but it wasn't benchmark oh, stable. Well, still, I mean, that's a, that, that you got definitely one of the finer CPUs out there. Not everybody got a 50 multi-cable CPU. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've got, I I actually ran the benchmarks. It was benchmark stable, opt stable at 4.9. Okay, that's great. Yeah. But what they did was they cut two days off of my time. Yep. I might have been able to get it. I might yeah, have been able to get it higher. Yeah, if, usually in our internal tests, if you have a 52 capable, you should be able to normalize that five. Yeah. Um, but what we... What we found out was that when you balance, of course, by thermals, 
you can still maintain really high driving efficiency in terms of the power delivery from the choke, but you're going to artificially cap it because since you want to keep the temperatures normalized to a lower temperature level, you won't ever let it reach its full power delivery level. So that's the reason why we give you the ability to switch to current. And that way, we can push the envelope further to get the most driving strength. Okay. Now, the, the cool part with that here, you know, first time ever, this is the really cool stuff that I find, you know, being a hardware guy, this is the really cool stuff. With the Digi Plus and the UFI implementation, on all the boards. Now keep in mind, this is the really cool part. It's not just the high end. It's all the way down to that $160 board. We're giving you unprecedented VRM controls real time in the OS. You can adjust load line calibration, OCP, the phase count, that thermal management in terms of the T-Pro current based or temperature based, even the VRM switching frequency. All real time on a hardware level with the operating system. So normally you'd have to do that in the BIOS, all yeah. that control, oh, yeah. right? And that just extends on what we had previously had before. So, you know, before we had Turbo V, which gave you all the clocks, the voltages, and then CP ratio gave you the multi, right? So it's pretty much now 90% of the BIOS is fully accessible in the Windows desktop. And with the way that Turbo has now been implemented on Sandy Bridge, you can pretty much ramp this thing up to five all real time in Windows. There's almost no point to need to actually execute it from within the, uh, from the UFI. So that's something that we're really happy on. And like I said, when we're talking about that general theme, that's something that's present across all the boards. So, you know, the UFI, the dual slot spacing, the right angle, the sensible, you know, uh, connectivity in terms of the placement of the headers, mm -hmm. and then even the little things, you know, like um, fan controls. We've really prided ourselves on the manual fan controls. If you take a look at the competitors, usually it's on or off. Yep. Right. That's about it. Um, on ours, we have three presets, and then on top of that, there's full manual control with target tone temperatures for the CPU fan and for the chassis fan. The reason why we do both, as you guys know, high performance guys like to do push-pull configurations. Yep. That way you can go ahead and automatically set it up to whatever you want. But same thing, you know, we want to make it easy. Fan Expert, it's got that built in here where you can go in and you can set the, the target zone temperatures also in the in the OS. Yep. So it's, it's, it's really nice to work with. And the kind of the last general facet is going to be the network controller. Now, no, it's not present on the standard, um, just because from a price point, it was a little bit too difficult to pinch it in. But going from the Pro all the way up to the rest, all have Intel LAN controllers. You know? And that's one thing that we're happy about, because when we take a look at the board design twos, we think that we're doing things differently from most of the other vendors, where as you sometimes go up in the board stack, you're not necessarily seeing better quality components being utilized. They might be copying us in terms that they have like a nice segment board that has an improvement in terms of the hardware, but you look at maybe their entry and their main and then their high end, and they're probably using all the same NIC. So we wanted to make sure that we put on a better class of NIC that these enthusiasts wanted. And, and that also means that we're trying to design the board though from a more balanced approach, because it's not just about overclocking, because overclockers don't care about an yeah, Intel NIC. Exactly. But a general enthusiast, whether he's somebody that does overclock or games or just uses mm. the system, you know, in a, in a high performance fashion, is going to appreciate that. Uh, here, I pulled it up, but you can see we have, all, of course, all the presets, but the user can go, you know, to user and you can define all these. Now, this is in the OS, but you still have that level of control also in the UFI directly. Okay. So we, we just pretty much wanted to give you as much function as you could get in here and there. Uh, now, rounding out the last kind of unifying theme is the AI Suite 2. I mean, this thing is awesome. And it's a big change for us. If you've ever worked with ACS4 in the past, even uh, the Crosshair 4 formula, we were still using our old implementation, which while some of the software was really great, the problem was nobody wanted to be Batman. Nobody wanted to have seven utilities. And most general PC users hate having a lot of stuff starting up with their system. Oh, yeah. So we wanted to have just one application that gave you a lot of functionality and, and one simple interface. The cool part, though, that I stressed a lot was modular ability. So we've got, you know, the, uh, all these options in terms of the Turbo V, the Digi Plus, Fan Expert. We've got the real-time auto-tuning process, um, which I'll note in a little bit. The cool part, though, is that let's say that the, uh, where am I at? Uh, settings, there we go. Um, that the user doesn't want all these functions. Maybe all they care about is just Turbo V and Fan Expert or something like that, right? They can go into the AI suite and essentially go ahead and gut everything out. They don't have to uninstall the programs or anything like that. They can just go ahead and pick this, this version, this version, and then it'll unload all those apps, and then they'll go ahead and just get the two applications that they want to run. And then choose maybe at a later time if they want to load up the other versions, they can do that. So here, you know, maybe I don't want the BT Go, I don't want this monitor. All I care about is Sensor Recorder and Turbo V, right? I don't even want system information. 
it'll tell you, okay, it'll unload the module, deactivate all the services, and then from there what's going to do is automatically relaunch it, but when it relaunches, it's only going to have just those two apps. Okay. So you can make it essentially as big as you want and as functional, or you can just make it as simple as you want. So we think it's kind of like the best way of having both worlds. We give you a lot of functionality, but we also know that it's not going to fit everybody's usage model, right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, pretty, pretty, pretty nice implementation. Uh, so that kind of covers, I guess, the, the unifying overview. The last big item is the audio tuning feature, which we have spent a huge amount of time on. Um, you know, most auto overclocking implementations do suck, you know, historically. They just weren't really any good. They were either buggy, they weren't reliable. But the way that we have it set up, it works with, you know, the, the TPU hardware controller, works with the BIOS. So what it actually does is it actually will automatically ramp the multi real time in the OS, make all the corresponding voltages. It even uses offset. We don't use a manual protocol. That way we can track the BRD, keep the voltages nice, tight, and even. So it's only ramping when it's under load. And even the stability test that we run real time as it's doing the ramping, it's a prime based integer test. So it hits it really hard, makes sure the stability is there so that at the end of the process, it's usually about five to eight minutes, the user can be asserted, I have a high level overclock. And we've even tuned the multi frequency to be supportive up to about 50 multis on Sandy Bridge. So what that realistically means is retail parts, we're probably expecting they're only going to be somewhere between about 44 to maybe about 47, maybe 48 for about 60% plus parts. Mm -hmm. So what that means is we made the auto-tuning mechanism essentially over spec. It'll auto-tune to what the max of the multi is. Um, what you'll see though, you got you, you haven't checked out the board yet, we have a new BIOS option though that we enable that you guys got to check it out. It's called internal PLL overvolt. Okay. It's a very special thing. It's, I'm super juiced about it because I had about 10 D2s. They were all locked usually at about like 44 to 45. I've now been able to push those on almost all 49 and 50 capable. Um, the only caveat is that all your rest of your VRM options stay the same, but it will require a little bit more vCore. Whereas normally before this option, you wouldn't, it didn't matter how much vCore you would apply, you would hit like that multiplier wall. Mm -hmm. uh, that kind of takes a, an overview for the uh, you know, for the mainstream series, but I think that, you know, when you look at it in terms of the cost to what you're getting, I think we're really setting the bar, you know, and then of course all the boards are all UEFI native, some of the competitors aren't, of course, having that present on our boards, 